In this session, we're looking at recording audio and video with Spike 2. To enable recording, I need to load the S2 video program. This is under All Programs on Windows 7, and you can see the Spike 2 video recorder alongside Spike 2 and the Sunfix program. Once activated, the S2 video program allows us to control which video and audio devices we wish to record from. Under settings, we can see a Sony Handycam and a very, very cheap webcam. Having selected the webcam, you can see now a simple video output. It is possible to run up to four copies of the S2 video program, each with their own data source. With the second instance of this program running now, I'm going to select the Handycam as an alternative device. You will notice at the bottom of each of these views that there is a declaration that a uh, running copy of Spike 2 has not been found. This is because we need the main Spike 2 sampling clock to time all video and audio to it. Depending on the make and model of the device which we are capturing data from, there will be differences in the settings available for each. Under audio here, I can see a microphone attached to the Handycam. Under device properties, there seems to be little available from the more upmarket Handycam. And rather surprisingly, under device properties for the webcam, so much more. Now I'm going to start Spike 2. As I do so, the message Spike 2 not found changes to ready. Let's now look more at the settings for video and audio capture. A very important point to note is that only devices that are compatible with Microsoft Direct Show will work with the S2 video program. Looking at the device properties again, we can see that there's an abundance of control, including compensation for fluorescent lighting at 50 or 60 Hz. Under video capture in the settings pull-down, we can see the frame rate and also the video output resolution. For many applications, 320 by 240 would be sufficient. Remember, the higher the frame rate and video resolution, the bigger the resulting file. Configuration settings now, and we can see here video and audio compression. There are three choices for each, on the fly, compress after capture and disable compression. Unless you have a very fast machine, then on the fly compression is not ready for you. We use what are called codecs for the compression and here is a list of those available on this machine. I'm afraid it is a little difficult to tell you which one is the best to use in all circumstances. Some seem very good when compressing offline and others good online. Try them and compare for yourself. Many codecs are free of charge but you may find paying for one is worth it. With the frame timing option we can help to synchronize the video and audio input. Fixed value is useful especially if we are timing the camera from say the 41 clock. Alternatively we can use frames time. This is useful if the camera really does run at a constant rate. We divide the data file time by the number of frames captured. The none option simply accepts the frame rate declared by the device or windows. There will almost always be a time offset between the time that Spike 2 starts running and the time that the camera records its first frame. This can be positive or negative. If your device tends to have the same offset each time, you can set it here. Some devices produce errors when we try to match the multimedia time base to the Spike 2 time. This does cause a drift between the two data streams, but we can compensate for that if we use the frames time option. OK to the configuration settings now to settings and set slow frame rate. This could be used as a form of pause while recording and we can set the maximum frame rate to capture as well. For my webcam I'm setting it to 30. You can command the program to use the slow frame rate here and now you can see it is ticked for selected. Calling up the second video window now, suitably called Capture 2, I would go through the same procedure with settings and configuration. Each window now indicates a ready state. The windows are resizable and can be commanded to always stay on top if selected from the view menu. 
Now a quick look at our sampling configuration, and we can see that I have a waveform set at 5000 Hz. Editing this channel also shows the use of a conditioner support, in this case CED1902 amplifier. A quick check on the settings here, and we press OK. Now to run now. The data file opens, and I'll just maximize this. Now call up the two video windows. The message at the bottom of each multimedia window now displays ready to record to data 1. The multimedia data is actually stored as AVI files sharing the same name as the data view. Now sampling, you should be able to hear the EMG in the background. Pulling up the two multimedia windows now, you should be able to see two camera angles of the same subject. For the webcam, I'm going to set it to use the slow frame rate. Dropped frames can happen and is an indication that the system cannot keep up. Reducing the resolution or investing in a better camera would help. Frame timing is still maintained throughout though. Stopping the recording now. The multimedia will not be saved as AVI files until we have saved the original Spike2 data file. At this point the offline video compression will take place. The difference in speeds of compression that we see here could be due to either the codex being different or the fact that the more expensive camera on Capture 2 actually delivered more data overall. Given the amount of data recorded, it can take a long time to compress the AVI files. Now that all the data is saved, I'm going to show the whole time range of this 50 second file, and I'm going to place cursor 0 on the screen. If AVI files exist in the same location as the data file opened with file and open, or in this case in review straight after capture, we have the option of multimedia files from the view pull down. Once open, the views are locked to the right hand edge of the visible data. We can see that position as a time at the bottom of each of the views. Earlier I placed cursor 0 on the screen. That is to allow me to use this function. Now as I drag cursor 0 you can see the view update. As only one view is tracking I need to select the second view to do the same. Editing the frame delay here allows me to give some offset to one of the views. As you can see, the view to the right doesn't start operating until three seconds have passed. I will set the view back to the original synchronization settings. Along the same button bar at the bottom, we have copy the current frame as a bitmap. There are also buttons for step to previous and next frame, play and of course pause. The scripting language gives access to video frame times and also the contents of the video signal. This enables us to write scripts for tracking position data. There we have it then, video and audio data capture with Spike 2. The images captured in the left hand view were via a cheap webcam bought for a few dollars. This was connected via USB 2. The right hand view collected its data through a firewire connection to a Sony Handycam, a much more expensive camera.